All right, hey everybody. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, Wasm IPLD, which is um, a, a library that I've been working on uh, recently to try and explore what it might look like to do some of these WebAssembly things um, to support IPLD use cases. So, so why? Um, there are lots of reasons why you might want to use IPLD and lots of reasons why you might want to use WebAssembly. Um, for me, what I wanted was a, a portable set of tool, of IPLD tools, um, written in Rust at the moment, uh, because I don't want to rewrite codecs and ADLs in Go and Rust and JavaScript and Python and wherever else. Uh, simply the function, the idea of like getting Unix FS readable in all of these platforms where you don't have to like delegate out responsibility to someone else to verify that your self-certified data works so like you can certify it yourself um, is, is already hard. It's like, oh, can, who, we, who can we give a grant to that will help out to like implement UnixFS and Python? Um, and, and what if we want this to work with more things? You want to work with BitTorrent and Git and Pergus and WinFS and, and more of these things. It's just a lot. Um, so currently it supports working with codecs and ADLs. That's the, the subset of IPLD tooling that it works on. Uh, so why WebAssembly and, and why use Rust for, for WebAssembly? So WebAssembly, because as uh, one mentioned, sort of portability in a, a lot of popular environments, not everywhere, but it's in a lot of places. Uh, and it lets me do dynamic loading of modules. Um, and, and Rust is sort of nice because uh, FFI is another one of these big interoperability tools that exist out there, right? If everything was FFI, then you'd get a lot of compatibility in places that can, can use that, which is many programming languages and environments. Um, and it has some of the more mature WebAssembly tool. And uh, I don't know, I keep having, I keep having some, uh, some colleagues that tell me that Rust is uh, better than sliced bread, so I figure I should learn, and I learn by doing, so let's do it. Um, IPLD overview, uh, for those who are not more deeply familiar, there's the IPLD data model, basically JSON, bytes, CIDs. Uh, it exists so that you can target it as an, you can target the data model as an abstraction over different types of data without needing to care about the particulars. Like there are Git files and BitTorrent files and I just wanna look at them as like bytes and files. And I, there are maps and there's JSON maps and Seymour maps and I just wanna be like maps and that's why it exists. Uh, IPLD codecs, uh, they, they basically transform bytes into the data model and the data model back to bytes. This is the function. Um, so I, I tried starting to be like, all right, let's, let's do a WebAssembly thing that does just codecs. Bytes, data model, data model, bytes. And trying to actually like build a, you know, sort of build a data model object, like have your map, fill it up with values, things like that, and calling functions across a WebAssembly boundary is like really no fun. Uh, it's no fun because you have to expose like all of these sort of opinionated functions on how to do so. Um, and it's the Rust tooling, again, mature, but not helpful because if you're not targeting JavaScript, you're sort of left to your own devices. Um, I work on this, this uh, program written in Go called Kubo that some of you may have used. And so, you know, that, that's sad for me if I want to make it work in, in that environment. Um, and, and, the, and even if all of the tooling was there, the performance is not good because you have to keep calling across the boundary over and over again. So the question was, uh, what if we could form a bidirectional serialization of the IPLD data model uh, and move from the serialized representation to bytes? and decode from bytes to the serialized representation of the data model, which is this thing I wrote called, called WAC, the WebAssembly codec. I didn't know what it was gonna look like. I knew what I wanted to use it for, so I named it for the use case. Sorry, let's rename it in the, in the PR on the spec if you have an interest. Um, it, the idea is it's supposed to be a concrete representation of the data model and easy, really easy to implement. Like I implemented it a couple of times. It's like a few, it was like a couple hours or something like that, because it has to be in all of the host's languages so that they can operate with it. Right, You're, we, we have this code, the code will move around, but then the code has to interact with the outside world, that outside world requires an interface, and then you're gonna have to code all of your hosts against that interface. All right, ADLs. Um, so codecs are bytes to data model. ADLs are basically data model to data model. 
um, bytes are part of the data model. So ADLs are basically a generalization on, on, top, of, on top of codecs. Um, there's not a specification of like when you do an ADL, it must look exactly like this. But do we even have one for codecs? So <laughs> um, if you look around at the implementations of codecs that exist today, they're all pure functions, basically. But they don't have to be. Most programming languages like make it very hard to implement like a pure function and enforce that it's pure. And you could do all sorts of like callouts. You could write a codec in any language that you use for IPLD things today, and almost certainly you could have a function that's like use random number and insert here. You wouldn't want to do that, but like you you could. Um, but I think it's reasonable to say that codecs are probably pure functions. Um, on the other hand, ADLs are not, right? So even though they're a generalization on top of codecs, most people are, use ADLs and conceptualize them as how to work with multi-block data structures. And multi-block means network I.O. or disk I.O. and so not pure functions. Um, interestingly, sort of the WebAssembly sandbox forces us to consider the syscalls that exist here and basically like clarify the mental models of what these things are. Like, None of this is like written down or explored in any of like the IPLD like docs or exploratory reports on, on how this stuff works, but like we have implicitly defined these things to work this way. And sort of like you write it out and it, it's, it's sort of interesting how that emerges. And I guess, right, so in our case we sort of say, oh actually we're not, it's not quite data model to data model, it's like data model and like this block loading function maybe, the data model, in terms of just how we conceptualize. So building, building one of these um, IPLD libraries for, for ADLs. Um, even though they both have data model outputs, both codecs and ADLs, we have to treat them differently. Um, ADLs can, like, if, assuming you have a block limit of some sort, right now two megabytes in most implementations that, that do this thing, you can probably handle all of that. ADLs you can reference, tremendous amounts of data. We have these humongous trees. And so I, I can't just like serialize my like one terabyte of data and like send it across the WebAssembly boundary and like have it all be okay. Like I, I have to have like partial functions to work with them. Um, you know, if the data is small, I could optimize and do the, go through WAC and do the decoding and send it back. Um, sort of interestingly, uh, in order to do some of the compatibility things that I would like to do, right? Make it make it so we can generalize over Git and BitTorrent and Pyrgos and WinFS and anything else that does this sort of thing. We we have to deal with the block limit problem, which limits our compatibility because if my IPFS tooling will only move around two megabyte chunks and you've decided that you have ten megabyte chunks that are also still hashed, then then we have a breakage. So we have to do that problem. I had a talk on that earlier this week. If you resolve that problem, then maybe codecs start to care about this too, because maybe the codecs become big enough that you don't want, or work on data that are big enough that you want to have this partial operation on them. Um, okay, so what did I do when I was trying to implement this, this ADL stuff, which is where most of the complexity lies? I got around almost all of the codec stuff very easy with this WebAssembly codec, like serialization thing. Um, I decided, let's just experiment. We're, we're, we're exploring and seeing how this goes, trying to learn from this. Um, so let's see what happens when we use the you know, best ADL, you know, ADL interfaces we have today, which are the ones from GoIPLD Prime. And you experience some issues, like I don't have parallel map access. I can iterate through maps, but I cannot in parallel access the elements, which means if I want to like iterate through a directory and get all the, get all the elements, I have to go one at a time, which is like a no-go, given that you need network access for all of the stuff, and serialization is, like, doing this in a linear way is really gonna hurt you. Um, but I feel sort of like an, an important part here is like we're not trying to build all of the abstractions we can afford. We're trying to build all of the abstractions that we need, and then learn about them and improve them as we understand what we need better. Maybe we need more partial access functions uh, for subranges on strings and lists. 
Uh, maybe we need recursive ADLs, or maybe they're a bad idea. Um, right now, you sort of, the only, the only call back from an ADL, uh, from, from WebAssembly to the outside world, is to ask for blocks, but like, I could construct it so maybe I could have ADLs call other ADLs. Um, some examples might be, you know, maybe I wanna have, I wanna concatenate a BitTorrent file and a UNIXFS file and like l l read that as a single thing of bytes. But I, I can't do that in a non-recursive you know, model that doesn't allow any form of recursion because uh, I'd have to redefine my, I have to like in include all of that BitTorrent and UNIXFS code like all together in one, one object. Um, you could also do sort of interesting things where you like we'll call it capture or like modify the, the process of the rest of your working with the data. For example, you could have like a, a load codec ADL that says I have like a bunch of bytes and I have a little field in front that's like it's DAGJSON. Okay, let me go call the DAGJSON encoder to go decode this data and then start working with it. Um, or do other fancy things like say I need to go fetch this CID and then go execute it and do stuff like that on, on the data, right? Those are all sort of this recursive reaching out kind of behavior. Seems like it has a bunch of utility, but also maybe very expensive if you don't realize how many of these like recursive calls you're making. Um, and also like room to improve like IPLD and, and, and ADLs like at that layer. Um, if you allow for parameters inside of ADLs, you basically get the decryption stuff that, that Juan mentioned, right? Because you can say, you know, interpret this thing as I need to decrypt you with AES parameterized by key, right? And that will make it, that will make it work. Um, some experience learning from WebAssembly and, and how, I, how we did this is that there's a lot of, every, everything that WebAssembly feels like dealing with is like an integer. It's so all you get is integers everywhere, as far as the eye can see, integers. Um, and so everything is like alloc, fill a buffer, Inter integer is the buffer, you know, have a pointer to the buffer, that's an integer, move it along, and then figure out how you're gonna do freeing. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the WebAssembly bindings seem to only be useful for, for JavaScript, so had to, base, had to like make up an ABI that was going to work uh, in Go and in other environments. And we see representation to do this, and then when the Go host bindings, you know, get the responses, they then will go and use CGO to, you know, undo all of the C representation stuff and get something a Go developer actually could interact with. Maybe I'm holding it wrong. Um, so I I, writ, I wrote zero Rust code up until a few months ago and zero WebAssembly things up until a few months ago. Uh, so most of you in the room know this better than me. Uh, if you want this stuff to work, your help is needed. We'll grow this together. Um, examples like how to make this easy for developers to work, uh, to work with and fulfill like the contracts for codecs and ADLs when you have, you don't really have interfaces, you have these like global functions that have specific names as required by like the exports for WebAssembly. How do I do any of the testing that relies on extern functions? I have like a terrible global map that I'm using. Surely there's something better. Um, and this one is, you know, maybe is more serious. Uh, again, uh, Juan referenced this in his previous talk, but like dealing with some of like the resource usage and like when to give up, right, timeouts, aborts, syscall, like resource utilization, how I want to deal, contention, how much parallelism, things like that. Like how do I, what is the right way to encode that data and move it into our WebAssembly functions and calls? On the Go side, what do we got? So I'm using Wasm time. Uh, there are sort of these generic Wasm codec and ADL objects. The codecs, you spin up your VM, you run your code, when you're done, Go will garbage collect it. Uh, ADL is more complicated. Um, you load an ADL and you get effectively a pointer to the data because you need to partially operate on it. And so because you're partially operating on it, 
you, you're sort of, it hangs around for longer. And again, if you have directories, and the directories have subdirectories and subdirectories, so you're getting more of these like sub ADLs that you need to hold on to. And, but once you're done with them, once you've done, you've traversed your whole directory, you've gotten, you've gotten your bytes out, you know, serialized the whole thing to a tar file, and you go home, okay, then the garbage collector will come in and clear everything out. Um, there is support for gas. Uh, you know, you can put in gas limits. I put in some things for like gas limits per operation. The modeling and figuring out like what are the right numbers to have, uh, was time doesn't make this easy, and that's a conceptually hard problem. Perhaps our FVM friends who have to deal with this in a much more real way will have some advice on how to do this. Um, maybe a little more concretely, so on the, go, on the go side from the host, I say I want to encode using my standard like Go, IPLD, prime data like you know, libraries. I would like to encode this IPLD node. Okay, first we'll encode it and, and whack, then throw it through the WebAssembly encoder. You know, done. Uh, decode, bytes, okay. First we'll put it through the WebAssembly decoder and then we'll decode it through WAC. Done. Uh, ADLs, things are more complicated. There's more functions. This partial stuff is, is difficult um, to get. Well, it's not necessarily difficult, but it's, it's more situational. What's the right form of partial access for you? How do you need it to work for your application? Um, so what I have is what I needed. Uh, so far it's maps and bytes, which are sort of interesting to explore independently. Bytes are interesting because you really may have very large bytes that you need to work with. Uh, and maps are interesting because they have this recursive property. Of course I ran into the very large maps thing because there's no parallel map traversal, but um, that's sort of another piece of this. And maps and bytes are what I need to do files and directories. Again, the goal, small goal. I just want Git and BitTorrent and UnixFS and WinFS. Like I want these all. I want these all to work. I want us to be able to explore and use different types of, you know, file system structures, and have them all work like file system things. Um, and something to to note is like, I'm, I'm I guess I'm talking about ADLs as if like, yeah, they're this like staple of IPLD of IPLD, and you've all used them, and like this all makes sense. And like, they're still pretty new. Um, there aren't too many of them that exist, uh, and the ones, that, e even in Go, which has the support for them. But they are this way, they are a model for how to say, I would like to execute code to transform the structure that I have here into something, into a different form that is more usable for me, right? Um, so let's build them and see what we need. All right, demos. So, yeah, I guess let's do a demo. Here's my demo. This is a Kubo node that has been modified. Not that much. Uh, and uh, there was an earlier version of this that uh, anyone who saw this talk up until, I don't know, several hours ago, uh, it looked instead like this, um, where I have slash IPFS, slash a CID. Um, for those of you not fluent in multi-formats, I'm sure you all are, but just to clarify, this is uh, CIDv1, uh, and this is the Bencode codec, which is the format that BitTorrent uses to encode data, um, and a SHA-1 hash. So this is, this is an info hash. This is, this is the thing that, like, if you were using BitTorrent, that you would be using as a reference handle. And then some selector to refer to the data. But uh, Mov has a proposal. Maybe, maybe we have IPLD URIs that are like maybe more usable. And maybe selectors are super duper powerful, but maybe sometimes we just need pathing, and that needs to look much more readable. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I did this one, I kind of got laughed at a couple days ago. And this one seems not so bad. Slash ADL is BitTorrent file or BitTorrent thing, not so bad. And we can do this for directories too. It's a thing, and oh, it's a BitTorrent directory. I would like to load koala.jpg, and there it is. Um, I find when I do these demos that have to do with almost anything on the IPLD side of things, 
The magic is that the demo is boring. I have loaded this Koala. I have loaded it in UnixFS. I have done it when it was BitTorrent stuff written in Go. I have done it when it is WebAssembly stuff written in Go. I did it with files. I did it with directories. And the point is they all look the same. And this is the point. This demo should be boring. I think that is. But like, yeah. Come on. That's really good. And certainly way nicer than this. So please, there's a, there's a spec PR, IPIP. It, it lives in IPFS specs. If you would like to see how do we make the URIs for this better, you don't like how this looks, you have a better idea, please go there. Really, we, we, we need it. We need better subgraph descriptors um, that are more usable for people. And this is at least the start. Um, all right, what's next? Yeah. So it could be encoded in the graph itself unless I don't get to control that because some other system has already created it, right? Like the, the info hash already exists. So where am I throwing the extra data? Just wrap it on a so, yes, yeah, yeah, you can. Depending on, so sometimes you can wrap things and sometimes it becomes cumbersome to wrap things. So for example, if you have like nested, if you have like nested ADLs, uh, or like if you need to have, right now I've shown sort of a capture thing where like there's an ADL at the top and that captures the whole of everything underneath. Um, if I need to execute ADLs in like multiple parts inside of the query, interpret as HAMP, then interpret as UnixFS thing, then interpret, it becomes more complicated because I may not always be able to get the data in the form that I want. When these things are not self-describing, their utility greatly decreases because you then have to introduce other side channels to bring in other information. Like for example, here you have to encode it in the query, uh, and in other places you would have to find ways in a, in a path, for example, you would have to pass it in as a parameter. So, so, so granted, I, I agree with you. A point I guess I can go back is that if we had a type of, we'll call it recursive ADL, you could define at the top and encode it into the URI scheme if you wanted to. Because the way in which you do the encoding to say it must look this way is like pretty, is like an opinionated thing in and of itself. If you allowed for recursive, a type, it doesn't have to be deeply recursive, you can kind of like, sort of like an unwrapping a for loop kind of thing. Uh, if you do that, you can allow capture at the top that says, actually, I'm gonna encode all the data inside the tree thing and do exactly what you said, and you just put a signal at the top that says this is how I'm going to do it. So you absolutely can do that. Uh, part of the idea here is to be like, we'll call it less opinionated, less controversial, so that we can start to iterate. But that idea says, okay, do we want to do that as this is the spec for the IPLD URI, and then make an opinion on how it is that you do the wrapping? Or do we say recursive ADL, we will define a mechanism for doing that, and that will be the mechanism people use, and if it catches on, then it's good, and if it turns out that we got it wrong, then we'll do a different one. That makes sense? So what did the Kubo changes look like? Uh, there were three changes. Um, two of them had nothing to do with this, um, and then one of them did. Uh, Kubo has never had ADLs before, that were not UnixFS. Um, doesn't even, it, in the way it even does the ones with UnixFS is a little bit weird. Okay, so I added a plugin interface to register new ADLs. I added a signaling mechanism uh, for HTTP gateways to indicate how to use the ADLs and signal them. Uh, until this morning, the only mechanism anyone had available was a selector to indicate it. Because we had, we had URI, we had hard-coded into the URI IPFS colon slash slash implies try UnixFS. That was like, that's where, that's where the signal lives. Then there was selectors that you apply on top on the query, and that's where the signal could live. This is another version of a cleaned up version of that. Another mechanism is of course inside the data. If you go to IPLD, uh, the IPLD docs, there's like a whole description of like the variety of places you could put signals and their trade-offs, and like, one of the most powerful things here I found is like, yeah, the selectors were a little gross. But like, 
having a hook anywhere allows the explosion of ideas that then allow us to push back and say, yeah, we need a better hook. It needs to live somewhere else. It needs to live somewhere better. But like something gets us moving, gets us thinking, gets us feeling it and, and making it, um, making us experience what it is that works and doesn't work. And then there was a little wasm piece, uh, which is make a wasm codec in ADL that defines how codecs and ADLs work abstractly over the wasm bindings. Some questions that get asked. These are the, the frequently asked, two of the most frequently asked questions. Uh, the config file, let's see if I can, I can pull this up. Here is the config file. This is it, it's just, here is the name of the, here's the name of the ADL, here's the path for it. Here's the name of the, here's the, name of the codec, here's the path for it. Um, some people are like, Ugh, paths, storing files, have you heard of the CID thing? I hear it lets you reference, it's like a pointer to data that like could live anywhere. That sounds like real good. Um, and yeah, you can totally do that. There's like a little bit of like engineering stuff you need to do to get the, the thing that loads codecs on startup to allow it to work after you've initialized the network so you can go fetch data. But like, yeah, you can totally do CIDs. Um, then there's a different one. The next one is, okay, yeah, okay, I see. I can, I can get the CIDs and put them in the config. Can I use the CID as the name of the ADL or the codec and have you load it on the fly? Um, so you definitely can't do it today. You can't even do the other one today. Seems like it's doable, a little more complicated, but this seems doable too. I've talked to a number of people about this. This is like, I don't have particularly strong opinions, but this seems to be a very controversial topic. Um, some areas that you know, get raised and then people have discussions about how the, what the answers are are, what happens when the code changes? There's a, bug in your, there's a bug in your ADL code or your codec. What happens when the ABI changes? A dean doesn't know how to write any Rust code. He, he, he made interfaces that are terrible. We fixed them in V2. What do we do about that? Um, what happens for nodes that can't support WebAssembly? They're, they're not everywhere, right? But depending on how deeply we encode them, right, if we say WebAssembly, this is the CID, you must run WebAssembly, how, how much does this like start to break the ecosystem for the places that can't WebAssembly or won't? Um, a compromise, perhaps, maybe to give things names and then allow them to pass hints as CIDs. Um, some of you who've been around in the ecosystem may have seen that something along like this seems to have been requested, like, I don't know, on the order of, 10 to the three or four times in just like the last, you know, several years of the project. Which is like, I would like a mutable address and then fall back to an immutable address. Which A, we, you know, gateway specs, make an IPIP, maybe do this. But also, maybe we do something like this for how we reference the code, right? We give it a mutable pointer, we give it a fallback to an immutable pointer. The mutable pointer is whatever, you know? Uh, you want, it can be a name like BitTorrent v1. It can be, you know, a public key. Probably don't use public keys because people because people's keys get broken. But like, maybe use something else, right? There's lots of people who are working on decentralized identification schemes. Might be useful here. Um, maybe a compromise that allows the folks who feel very strongly about this to uh, get along with each other. Um, and, and where do we go from, from here? This seems like pretty workable, actually. Like, we can use this and like load files and directories. And files is really easy. We actually made a bunch of progress yesterday on like how we might be able to specify how directories work. Probably some work will spin up out of this coming out of the event if you are interested in the uh, channel for the event. Say hi. We'll connect you with some folks. Um, it may unlock people being able to like build new codecs and ADLs without it being painful because they're like, how do I support them? Um, maybe talk to some folks who've written some codecs and how it takes like, oh, it's gotta make it into this part of the ecosystem and this part of the ecosystem and how do I get these people to pin my data and walk my graph? It takes time. This maybe makes it easier. Um, we need to like review and go through and make the implementation better uh, yeah, 
I don't know what I'm doing. It worked. I don't know. I don't know how, but it worked. Um, I need your help. If you want this thing to work, it, it needs your help. It needs, it needs your view. Your view is important and probably more useful than mine. Uh, and then we get to start using it and see what breaks and what needs to get better. Um, how might we get this in Kubo? If, right? Uh, reviews from the knowledgeable folks. I see some of you in here. Some of them are not in here. We'll go get them too. Um, there's some like technical pieces around, okay, we need Seago so that we can use Wasm time because most of the good WebAssembly VMs run in not Go at the moment. Uh, we need to figure out the signaling mechanisms. You have opinions on the signaling mechanisms. There's some spec PRs. Thanks.